Breaker TV. Hey gamers, it's Ed Park, AKA Togrim. I'm here with Pat Wyatt, the CEO of NMAS Entertainment. And you guys are launching Terra soon, as I understand you have your closed beta three happening tomorrow. Um, can you tell us about the work you guys can be doing between now and the end of April when you start your early access? Sure, you know, um, building a game requires that a whole bunch of facets come together at the same time. And so uh, while, you know, we've actually launched our online store and our online forums, just the other day we launched the Terra Answers site, which enables people to get their questions answered in a really public way. And over the next couple weeks, we're going to be doing some back-end integrations, uh, actually making sure the billing system can support subscriptions, which is okay. not done yet. <laughs> but beyond that, there's also a lot of work that's still being done in the game. And so we get regular builds from the development team. Uh, we got one just a couple days ago that players will get to try in CBT3, and then okay. we'll get some feedback from that, and so we'll fix some more things in CBT4 and 5 as we you know, prepare to roll out for launch. A lot of the community really isn't clear what the distinction is between the game developer, which is Bluehole Studio, and you guys, you know, and Mass. Can you describe what the difference is between the developer and the publisher, and how you guys work together? You bet. Um, so developers, you know, they're they're going to build the game, but there's uh, there's some things they have to do in order to help us uh, launch the game, like um, telling us the ideas that they have, interacting with us to you know to understand what the community needs uh, in terms of features that are going to make the game appropriate for the West. And so our job is to sort of interpret what the developers are trying to do, present it to users, interpret their feedback, and provide it back to the development team in the ways that they can really take action on it. But beyond that, there's also a whole bunch of functions that we have to perform in order to launch the game. I mean, it's our company is actually about 70 people in the States, which is tiny compared to some of the game industry giants out yeah. there. But we have to you know, serve up sort of the front side of the business, you know, public relations, community, marketing, the operational side, customer support, um, analytics to understand what's going on. Of course, security is critical for an MMO so that our yeah. players have a really secure play environment. Um, and, you you know, then you've got all the sort of support functions like finance and HR. So it really is a lot of responsibility for a very small team here in the West. Yeah. Now, there's been some speculation from the developer, I'm uh, sorry, from the gaming community that you guys will have developers within Onmass making changes to the, the code that you're getting from the developers. Is that the case, or is, are all the changes going to be made um, by Bluehole? Well, so there's a combination of changes that are, um, you know, some of them are done by BHS, some are done in the West. So, for example, um, the most uh, easily visible thing that's, that was changed by by the team at NMAS is the writing and the addition of a lot of quests to the game. Okay. Um, you know, obviously if you take a story and you just translate it directly from the original Korean, it's not going to really translate well because it's not going to have the cultural reference sure. that you would expect from a Western story because there are things that we just don't have in our cultural history that would make sense to players. Right. And so there's a lot of story rewrites, but then there's also a lot of story additions and even some things that were added to the story that are making it back into the Korean version. Okay. Um, but then beyond that, you know, a lot of the game balance uh, was something that was really heavily developed over here to make the leveling curve really appropriate for Western gamers. Uh, there's some of the design uh, aspects of the game, like um, you know we we designed some new features. Uh, some of them at the request of players. Some of them things we expected that players would want. Um, and then some of the things you know we just requested the development team. Hey, here's some problems. Why don't you guys go and tell us what ideas you might have to solve those things? So it's really a collaborative effort. And of course, I would say that you know Bluehole is really doing the vast bulk of all this work. Right. But there are elements that are really shared. You mentioned you know about being able to add quests. So when BHS developed the game, did they provide some sort of like kind of like content creation, quest creation tools for you guys to be able to create those quest lines and just kind of hook them into the game? Uh, no, it's really a more complicated process than that because. Um, you know, there are lots of different types of quests, and so um, they don't have a generalized tool framework. You know, it's a first-generation game. Okay. Normally, when you, you build a game engine, you know, you kind of rush to get everything done the first time, <laughs> and then like in generation two, three, four, sure. you're more likely to have tools that will really help you build those types of things. Yeah. But instead, we went through a design process of understanding how the quests are engineered right now, okay. and then writing the sort of framework for them, and sort of like saying, hey, what, would these things work? Would these not work? How, how about these ideas? Getting, getting some feedback, and then going through multiple iterations until the development team in Korea actually ended up engineering those quests okay. into the game. Okay, so you guys are almost handling it from a, a, like a content design and writing uh, requirements perspective, and then handing once that stuff's kind of polished, handing it over to the development team to just go ahead and implement it. Exactly. Okay. okay. And of course, and for what other types of things do you guys have to localize? Are there things like with the UI design or the fonts or, or other types of kind of game content or structure? Yeah, there are a lot of changes. I mean, you know, uh, Terra has launched over a year ago in Korea and yeah. then a little bit uh, less than that in Japan. And so, you know, you think, well, the game's done, why don't you just launch it here? 
But there are a lot of things in the game that we didn't feel would be appropriate for the Western market, and okay. so we wanted to change those. And I mentioned the leveling curve. But for example, another thing is um, like the way that the, the stores uh, work for players. Um, so in, in a, a lot of Asian games, there are private stores, but those don't seem to work so well in the West, and there's a lot of complaints against them. Yeah. So instead of what we did was we worked with the development team to beef up the auction house, and okay. that's the primary mechanism for players to trade if they're not trading you know, face to face. If you want to like register something and leave it out there for players to buy, you put it up on the auction house. Okay. Um, another big uh, feature change was um, bind on equip versus bind on pickup. So in, in the East, they do bind on equip, and we do bind on pickup. So if you, if you kill a big ass monster, <laughs> and you drop some cool loot, if, as soon as you pick it up, that, that item is now bound to your character, which is really traditional in Western games. And the advantage for us is um, that actually enables us to give out bigger rewards to players because okay. um, you have less worry about people farming those things and polluting the online economy, and so players get some really cool drops from big-ass monsters. Okay. Right. Um, but there's some features that we've added that, that are shared across all the markets. And so, for example, when we first started playing Terra, we saw that it would be awesome on a game controller because really the development team's focus was to get your eyes on the center of the screen yeah where the action is instead of on the periphery where the controls are. Yeah. And so there's very little control framework that you have to deal with. And so it works really naturally with the console controller. And so that change obviously just ports directly back to Korea. There's no reason for the folks there not to have it. And then, you know, there's other things that we've uh, requested that, that really make sense to do in both territories, like achievements, yeah. um, uh, resting experience, that every player in the world would get the benefit of. Right. You know, you'd mentioned there's certain features that can be rolled out in North America and maybe EU, but not to, you know, K-Terra, J-Terra, et cetera. Um, do you know, how is BHS planning to manage this? Are they going to, like, have multiple branches or versions of their code they're going to, because I'm just, it just sounds like a really complex, it's not just one game, it's kind of multiple versions of the game, oh, yeah. you know, so how, do you have uh, any, any visibility into how they're planning to manage that? Well, it's really daunting because, you know, there's the versions that you can see, right? There's, like, the Japanese version, the Korean version, and yeah. the, the, like, the, the you know, uh, Western, which might even be split. There might be some things that are different, probably more from a platform side between Europe and uh, North America, and then eventually other territories roll out too. But then behind the scenes, you don't see that there's even more branches because there's multiple versions in development, <laughs> you know, to try and hit certain different sure. milestones and events that might be running. Yeah. And so you really need a, a version control system to manage all this stuff. And then even beyond that, like uh, each of the territories has a live team associated with it, and the live team's job is to track, you know, their branches to merge the features in from their branches into the master branches where appropriate, okay. or to keep stuff separate if it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, and it, you know, sometimes you have little accidents, like uh, I think at one point we had the wrong logo on our game for a while. Okay. It's like, whoops. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's, it's tough work. So as far as, like, the QA side of those things, is it the developer's responsibility to QA their code, and then you guys just run it in your environments and sanity check things look okay, or, or does part of that burden fall on your team as well? Yeah, it's really both teams. I mean, it's essential to have uh, good quality control all the way through. So, you know, Bluehole does a lot of testing in-house. They have a very large testing team there. Uh, we also benefit by the fact that, you know, the game is already launched, and so a lot Lots of players in Korea have, you know, helped discover problems with the game, you know, balance issues and things, and so those those areas already got fixed. But then when we bring it over to our side, um, we have two teams internally. We have a QA team that's primarily responsible for bug testing, mm -hmm. and then we also have uh, another team which is responsible for play balance. And there's some crossover. I mean, obviously, if the play test team discovers bugs, they're going to report them. But by focusing each team on their relative areas, you know, you get some really laser-like sharp focus yeah. on the specific areas of the game that need attention. Okay, and then as far as the, the core combat, are the mechanics uh, the same between the you know, versions over in Asia and the ones that are coming that you guys are going to launch? Oh, you bet. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the thing that was most solid about Terra, and really I think the thing that convinced most of people to actually join the company was just how much fun the game was to play yeah. in a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Yeah. And really, you know, like, obviously you want to play games that have, like, long-term rewards and big things you're doing and sure. complicated stories and quests that you enjoy. But ultimately, you know, most of the time you spend in the game is, like, doing the basic elements of the game, crafting and combat. And so you want those elements to be really exciting. And, you know, when I first sat down and started playing Terra, I knew it was going to be a hit because it was so much fun to play. It was the same kind of experience I had going from like a turn-based strategy game to playing uh, Dune 2 as a real-time strategy game and seeing like how much faster and more exciting the game became because of the instantaneity of, of like interaction with the game. And so um, 
you know, that really just didn't need any changes at all to come to the West. All right, so Pat, one of the hottest topics about Terra um, among the gaming community is the hitbox size. So um, basically, depending on your character, your race, like if you're a, a Baraka, you might be big and wide versus, you know, if you choose like a Potpourri, you're, you're kind of small and narrower. And there's been some discussion as to whether or not the character size, your hitbox size, influences your ability to be hit and your ability to target hit other players based on things like reach, et cetera. Um, do you have any, can you share any information about what that's going to look like for Terra North America? Sure. Well, so I can't give you exact numbers, but, but broadly speaking, yes, players are right. There are some differences in hitbox sizes, but the development team is aware of this. Uh, and so what they've done is rather than trying to sort of squeeze everybody in the same hitboxes, they've adjusted the reach of different character classes. So, you know, the, the very uh, short squat Papori will have a little bit longer to reach to make up for their uh, for their character size. And so, um, you know, the development team has spent a lot of time balancing this in order to ensure that even though there are differences, you're not going to see something like, well, all players end up being, for example, Baraka because they're really big or Papori because they're really small. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, they've, they spent some time working on that. Okay, so it's, so it's like even if you're shorter, it doesn't mean you'll have a shorter reach. It's, it's, it'll be, um, it's been adjusted to make, I guess you could say normalized or, or made. Um, you know on the receiving end as far as getting hit, if someone's shooting arrows, because you know, Tara, you've got to aim and make sure your target intersects the, the path of your weapon. Um, what, does the character size, the hitbox from that size, uh, make a difference as far as the, the receiving end, getting, getting a blow landed on you? Yes, it would, it would also have an impact there as well. Okay. As far as uh, launching the game in the West, I heard that Frogster is going to be launching it in Europe and then you guys are handling it in North America. Was there ever any discussion of having a mass, you know, handle launches for both uh, both regions? Well, so we would have loved to launch the game in Europe, but, you know, when we started this whole thing uh, just a couple of years ago, um, you know, it was more of less a, a dream in some people's eyes and the, uh, the complexity of launching a publishing studio across multiple territories is really challenging. I mean, you know, the, the process of growing from uh, just four of us, or I, I guess five initially, um, up to the 70 that we are now, um, was a really daunting prospect in the time available. And so doing that across multiple continents would have been quite challenging. And so we're really actually happy to have Frogster take uh, the burden from us and launch the game there so that you know players in both territories can play at the same time. Okay. Terra is a property that's owned by BHS, and you guys have a unique relationship based on how your, your company was structured. Um, are you guys, right now, is your focus on, on getting Terra to launch, or are you trying to kind of build the groundwork or infrastructure so that when you take other games from other game developers, you know, not BHS, that you'll have those things in place? Uh, the latter, yeah. If you look at the account management platform we've built, it's not the Terra account management platform, it's the NMAS account platform. Okay. And in fact, you'll see that, for example, if you wanted to buy two copies of Terra, um, you can do that within one master account framework. And so you'll be able to add other games within that as well to sort of simplify your life, create a you know uniform uh, online identity for all the games that you play, if you desire. Yeah. Um, you can also create split your account so you can have separate identities if you, if you would like that. Um, but uh, because we can develop these long-term relationships with players, you know, you can discover when we when we launch other games, oh, some of my friends are playing Terra and some are playing, you know, this other game, you know, which game do I want to play? Um, we'll alert players to where their friends are so that they can play across many different okay. games. Okay, yeah, build on a network of games. So very interesting. You've mentioned you're really the bridge between the game developer and then the actual players. Um, what are you doing on the relationships on both sides, both between the developer and, and yourself as a publisher and then between your company and the gamers? So to create like a differentiated experience or relationship so you know in the future that people would view you as a premium uh, game publisher you know. well, that's a huge question um, so let me attempt to break it down into a couple different parts so first is like the relationship between the development studio and the publishing organization um, you know that's something we knew was going to be challenging because many of us have actually worked in developing or bring rather bringing uh, games from Korea to the West um, and so the you know you've got uh, cultural differences, you've got language differences, you've got time zone differences, <laughs> and so those things all result in differences and expectations that are often unstated. And so a big part of it is actually sitting down with the developers on a regular basis, um, you know, in person, you know, over some soju usually, um, <laughs> great rice wine, uh, and uh, you know, sorting out what those differences are and really trying to expose the details of what those differences might be by uh, extensive dialogue. And of course then you continue that with video conference and, and email, but you constantly get surprised by issues where you think that you uh, both think the same thing about something, but you have different interpretations because of language sure, differences sure. primarily. 
Um, although it is certainly challenging because of time zone issues. So we just realized that's a constant process we have to work through, and we have a lot of staff members whose job is to communicate back and forth yeah. between the two teams. So the second aspect of your question is really like how does Enmass establish itself as a premier publisher? Yep. Um, because there are lots of game publishers out there, and there's right. lots of games. And so why should a user pick our game over some other of their many choices? And, and there's a lot of answers there. I mean, one of them is that you know users want to find a game that they really can enjoy and play for long periods of time. Because once you've made that investment in a game and you've got your friends in, you want to you want to be able to stick around. You won't have to keep exploring other games like ah that's sure. okay. It's not well. It doesn't quite scratch the gaming itch that I have. You want to find a game that you really enjoy and stick with it. So I mean, first thing is to deliver a game that has that level of excitement and fun, and it has a long path ahead of it, yeah. and you know a big end game. And that's why I feel like we're really fortunate because Terra has already been launched in other territories, and so they've had a chance to flesh out a lot of those components. But then beyond that, you know, online gaming is a service business, um, which a lot of people don't take into account, because you know, there's a box product that gets shipped on yep. retail shelves, although you can buy online these days. Um, but you know, because that box goes out, some people say, well, we shipped it, we're done. But you know, consumers know differently. They know that they're going to be playing that game, and you know, from time to time, they might have troubles. So. We want to make sure that they can contact us in a variety of different ways. So unlike a lot of publishers, we provide really easy to access support. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 366 on leap years. <laughs> it's chat-based support, phone support, or uh, ticket-based support. So people can contact us with the method that they want. Um, you know, if they can't get through to our phone lines, we'll actually call them back. Um, you know, we do a lot of different forms of communication, right? So we have a blog, we have our forums, we have the answer site. And so we're trying to provide a lot of venues for players to tell us what they feel and what they want um, in ways that we can hear. And then it's really important for us to also analyze the game and spend a lot of time um, with like data analytics to understand okay. what players dig and what they don't so we can fix and improve this stuff. And I think that that's one of those things where you know I could try and say, hey, we're going to be awesome. But I think that, that players just need to experience it and you know we will do better by demonstrating the level of service we provide rather than like sort of trying to brag about it up front. Okay. So we've we've endeavored to do that by doing a lot of like a uh, public events, like the closed beta tests, yeah. like the focus group tests, to show players, you know, here's what the game is now. Please consider it not done and tell us what we can do to fix it. And then as we deliver new versions, they can see their feedback incorporated into each new version, so they know that we are actually in fact listening. That's interesting. So it sounds like not only are you guys going to build out a, a kick-ass platform and environment and uptime and availability from an infrastructure standpoint, but you're doing multi-channel. 24-7, 366, 365, 366 days a year, uh, customer access so people can reach. And I know even from closed beta, I had sent a couple messages to customer support and received responses in a pretty good turnaround that mm -hmm. very specifically addressed my question. So uh, I, I thought that, that was a very good, positive first interaction to have I'm with customer service in beta. So yeah, not just the game, but, but the actual, the, the surrounding parts. Um, and then you mentioned around the, the analytics. You guys are going to be looking at the data, what users are doing, et cetera. Um, are you doing that based on capabilities that the developer is providing you, or, or are you, through your own infrastructure, you're implementing some way of having visibility into what the players are actually doing. Sure. So, um, you know, analytics is a huge growth field, and incidentally, if, yeah. if folks are looking for a job right now, <laughs> analytics is a great place yeah. to start looking. It's a huge area um, of opportunity. Um, so, actually, we're we're blessed because you know there's a bunch of analytics tools that have been developed by Bluehole in Korea for the other territories. Okay. But also, you know, we felt that it was so important that we brought on uh, you know data analyst folks, data analysis folks, in order to build our own system as well. And so we have um, you know a system that's really cool because it's uh, real time interactive. You don't have to go to the, the BI guy and say, hey, pretty please, can we have this report with this new facet in it? Yeah. Instead, it's like, here's the data. You know, you can pivot it yourself. You can look at it, and you can ask questions and try and understand, um, you know, what those answers might be, um, like in real time. Oh, in real time. Okay, that's amazing. I know sometimes you can get like a batch report of like get a get a replay of what users are doing in a given zone or instance or whatever. But you're actually able to look at the data in real time and see what that's people right. know. That's a really powerful capability. Well, thank you so much for your time, Pat. It's been a pleasure uh, talking to you, and I hope the initial launch for Terra goes well, and that you guys are successful in building out your your brand as a premium publisher. Let us know what you think of this video, uh, please post your comments and share this. Take care.